So without further ado, I would like to ask the members of the panel to please introduce yourselves. You want to start out? Okay, I'm Jackie DeSalvo. I uh, have taught at CUNY. I'm now retired teaching part-time. I created the uh, labor working group in Occupy and was there before it even happened <laughs> when the people at Bloombergville got the call from Ad Busters. So I had a lot of experience with it and I've been an activist since Mississippi Freedom Summer. I'm kind of old. And Jackie has an article about Occupy in the issue. Uh, my name is Jose and um, I uh, I was raised in a Marxist Leninist Maoist family uh, that understands intersectionality. Um, and uh, on the other hand, much of my adult life has been in anti authoritarian uh, movements, ranging from counter globalization to, the, to some of the anti militarist wings of the anti war movement, to Occupy Wall Street, to Cop Watch. So, um, so uh, some of us in my generation have the benefit of having a lot of different uh, angles to, to this. Um, this question, uh, and I do research, I do writing, um, I've written on police abolition and other things for Rolling Stone, uh, I do radio uh, with, uh, on BBC and, and on podcasts, um, and I do independent researching, but most of all, I'm uh, an activist for Rolling Stone. And he, he co-wrote the article on autonomism in oh. this issue. Hi, my name is Mark Bray. I'm a member of the Black Rose Anarchist Federation and the Industrial Workers of the World. Uh, yeah. Um, got one, one shot. <laughs> I'm also the author of this book, Translating Anarchy, the Anarchism of Occupy Wall Street, based on interviews with people in Occupy and my experience as a member of the press working group and direct action working group. My publisher has a table here, but they do not have my book there. So I have the book here, if you are interested. Um, and I'm also a PhD candidate in modern European history at Rutgers University. And just want to take the opportunity to thank Science Society for having uh, me on the panel to represent a different perspective. OK, so um, uh, Jerry. Right. <laughs> Just in the nick of time, Jerry, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Gerald Meyer, and I'm on the board of um, Science and Society and Political Activists since I was a kid. And I wrote a bio of Vito Marcantonio, and uh, worked on a lot of work about uh, radicalism and immigrant, immigrants a lot, you know, and I'm glad to be here. And? and <laughs> Jerry has a special review article on Italian anarchism in America that's in, a, in this issue. Okay, so what we, I suggest that the procedure be as follows. Um, each one of the panelists will have about 10 minutes to make an opening presentation. We can actually just proceed from Jackie all the way down. Um, Mark um, will will be the, um, what do they call it, uh, clean up batter on the panel for the first presentations. And then uh, we'll open the, um, we'll open the floor and um, take comments and questions and we'll have a chance for everybody hopefully to, who wants to, to uh, put in their two cents. I will probably try to restrict those comments to two minutes maybe. So, uh, I'm going to ask people to be um, to be sharp and pointed with their comments or questions, okay? And I have a little timer on my watch that's set for these minutes. So when the timer goes off, you panelists know that you've got to then uh, you've got two minutes left, okay? Okay. Okay, uh, it's possible, but uh, I'm mainly going to talk about how anarchism operated, occupied, but it has more general uh, implications. And the first thing, I just heard a story, um, the enormous influence that this brief movement has is remarkable. The story I just heard was from a social workers panel where someone said, nobody came the last time, this time the room was full, they're all organizing as low-wage workers. They said it's because they saw activism in, in Occupy, that they got inspired to do things. Um, the thing that I think was most uh, influential, I think it's the first mass movement to say that everything root of, everything comes from the domination of the ruling class. 
Uh, there were parties that believed that, but to popular, I think everybody knows, my students always agree that we live in a plutocracy. They thought we had democracy in certain ways, but they knew that the rich controlled politics. But it never was articulated so widely. And once it was, I mean, I just hear it like every other day. Someone, yeah. you know, there was Mitt Romney as the 1%, yeah. uh, Cuomo as governor 1%, uh, Bloomberg as mayor 1%, every day, Rahm Emanuel. Uh, uh, it really got picked up because it's true. Uh, right. The uh, activism, uh, I think, came, what's exciting about the activism, uh, although I'm an earlier generation of radicals, was that a new sector and a new generation became mobilized. And at the time, the surveys show that that sector was mainly a downwardly mobile uh, group of kids whose parents had you know, middle class standards of living, they couldn't get jobs, they were in debt and guaranteed a life of almost debt servitude. And therefore, going against the banks was very, uh, attractive, um, and I think it's very encouraging that there is this new sector of the working class that is moving, and the challenge is, how does it get related to the rest of the working class, and I don't think Occupy solved that problem at all. Um, the other thing is uh, that it was taken very seriously by the ruling class in a way that the counterculture, which had same, some of the same values, never was. Uh, Homeland Security met before we occupied with Wall Street to work out a strategy. And we know now from Freedom of Information documents that they closed them all down within a few weeks in a way that was organized by Homeland Security. I can't go into the details of how. Uh, the other great thing was that there was a very widespread public uh, publicizing of that the people in Occupy rejected the capitalist myth that it brings progress, democracy, uh, mobility. You know, it just said this is all BS. It brings uh, ruling class domination and increasing uh, inequality. And uh, the other thing is that it pointed out the weakness in our form of democracy that our representative democracy didn't represent anybody, and uh, it tried to, I don't think it worked out a, mo a mode, but it tried to argue for a form of, of direct democracy that would be much more participatory. It also rejected the politics of simply trying to influence uh, politicians and engage in direct action, and I think that's had a big effect. And they couldn't muffle our message because every other day we marched on Wall Street. It was clear what we thought the problem was. Uh, the other thing that I would say, I'm going to talk about the weaknesses, but the other thing that I thought was a strength was identifying that the whole 99%, I don't think it's quite the whole 99%, but a large majority of the population were oppressed by the same forces and should seek to unite. Now, it never had a strategy for how you united them and who was aligned with who and which classes were uh, prioritized, but it did uh, raise the idea of that we sh they should be united. Um, the weakness, oh, just about Marxists, I was always re regretted, there were some Marxists there, but not enough, and so there was never enough of a debate between the anarchist and the Marxist point of view about how we should organize ourselves mm -hmm. and what kind of a strategy. It was kind of assumed and never really got to the point, maybe if we'd been there longer, of uh, debating it. Uh, the weaknesses were also what I think Marxism could have provided, is that there was no systematic analysis of where this rule came from. Uh, there was no analysis of where capital came from. Um, so, and since there was no analysis of uh, that capital came from exploitation of workers and, and basically robbing the surplus, there wasn't a vision that a reorganized society would have to deal with redistributing the, sur the surplus and that could not be done by little autonomous communities or they would just keep it for themselves. It certainly wasn't anti-imperialist. Um, the organization sadly meant that we were not sustainable. Originally it went viral, 
But first of all, most of these communities around, around the country, except for the West Coast and uh, New York, were not anarchist. <laughs> um, it was impossible to be in some of these uh, communities. Um, the, so what we tended to do was fetishize process. And the process we would use ourselves within our own uh, community. In doing that, we did not recognize what kind of organization and strategy would be necessary if you acknowledge that right now we are in the heightening of a class war. The working class is under attack. It's losing almost all of its tools for fighting that attack as one legislature after another takes away uh, union rights. Um, if you're in a class war like any war, you need discipline, you need unity, and you need some centralization. I would not have liked to fa face Hitler with a bunch of a federation of autonomous communities. Wow. A, a war. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody pointed out, you know, anarchists are saying what they think is too much repression under socialism. Uh, but, you know, like somebody pointed out yesterday, after the Civil War, you had to repress the old plantation owners. They lost the vote. They lost the ability to hold office. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to have an opposition class, and in most uh, revolutions they're supported <coughs> by outside uh, imperialists, um, you can't just operate with local forms of democracy. Also, I thought that the emphasis on autonomy often confused democracy with liberty. And so we kind of fell into the capitalist myth of uh, the free individual. And uh, within our functioning, the emphasis on free expression <coughs> meant that uh, all ideas were equal. And they're not. Uh, it also allowed infiltrators to destroy our decision-making uh, processes. Uh, and the adoption of consensus meant that uh, decisions either couldn't be made or they were dominated by 10% of a small minority. The biggest, uh, already got two minutes. <laughs> the biggest problem I thought was that it was a form of democracy that was utopian and prefigurative. That is, that what we were doing, and it was possible in the park, kind of to model what the world we wanted to live in. But it wasn't replicable, it wasn't scalable, and it wasn't realistic. I don't think that two, three, many. Uh, Liberty plazas are the way to get socialism. I also don't think, as some of the anarchist theorists have said, that the other main problem is that you may not like the state, but to ignore that you have to fight it is impossible. You can't deny the power of the state, and denying the power of the state denied the power it would have to repress you, which it did rather rapidly when it was uh, ready. The other problem was that we kind of bought into the present right-wing uh, policy of uh, not making demands for government services, but instead vastly subsidizing the 1% through uh, tax diversions. And uh, the fact that we thought we could take care of it through mutual aid, there's always a place for that kind of, uh, you know, people helping each other. Uh, but you know, it was unrealistic to think in Occupy Sandy that, and it was great in the beginning, people provided an enormous amount of service, but that without fighting for resources from the government and FEMA, that most of the needs could be met, and most of the needs were not met. Um, the other major problem is that a strategy like that utopian strategy meant that the outreach was very limited. Uh, we could not reach whole sectors of the population that couldn't come to long meetings in Zuccotti Park and needed, needed us to support their struggles. By not supporting uh, demands, we were not supporting or aligning with the uh, struggles. Um, okay, that, that's a signal. Okay, uh, yeah, there's one or two other things, but uh, I guess it'll have to wait. <laughs> This is this panel, as I'm sure John has pointed out, uh, uh, evolved out of a special issue in science and society on anarchism, Marxist encounters with anarchism, and uh, we hope everybody subscribes to science and society.
and it's a wonderful journal and allows this to occur and uh, the article to be published. Um, uh, my contribution in, uh, to the special issue it was about uh, the experience of a uh, under-researched and almost unknown uh, phenomenon of uh, anarchism in America, which was the uh, anarchist uh, movement, Italian immigrant anarchist movement in the United States. And uh, I was interested in it for itself, but also because I do think it spoke very widely to the general problems of anarchism uh, and, and, and the contrast, I think, between anarchism and Marxism. So what I'd like to do here is not try to replicate the article, but to really talk about the more general context within which I wrote my article. Um, anarchism and Marxism are, are similar uh, in the sense that they both, uh, they both express a revulsion uh, to capitalism and the inhumanity of capitalism and all of the depredations that we're aware of and they would live and were aware of um, but right, I think, from the origins is, is to see that, in theory, I think there's, it's right at the heart of the difference between anarchism and Marxism, is anarchism really places the focus in opposition to authority. And authority meaning not just a political authority, uh, but it, it would mean religion, for example, very, very strongly. Most uh, anarchist movements were as anti-religious as they were anti-capitalist, you know, uh, and any form of authority, organizations, in family, uh, in communities. And uh, Marxism says that the problem was private property, and that by the elimination of private property, that a, a, a socialist world could be built. Perhaps Marx had in mind primitive communism, for his own term, of when private property predated class society, there was a society, which was most of, the, most of our time as, as human beings, where uh, the inhumanity of man to man really was uh, reduced greatly. But there's a very, very different uh, approach between uh, targeting authority in general and uh, targeting private property. It leads to a, a very different politics and very different emphases and um, so uh, I think what happens, I think, also with anarchism is the belief that uh, what is necessary is really to eliminate the superstructure. And that if you eliminated the superstructure, what existed below really could work itself out. Anarchism predates Marxism by a lot. It, um, anarchism appears almost <coughs> instantaneously, I think, with capitalism. Uh, you could think of Sir Thomas More, Utopia, for example. But then going forward to all the utopian socialists, it's very, very strong with Proudhon, uh, but even with Fourier and so on. It predates uh, Marxism by a great deal. Uh, and it, it, what it really is, is nostalgic. It's nostalgic for feudalism. It's based on uh, a memory. Uh, of, of somewhat romanticized memory, I think, uh, in large part, of the, of the peasant communes, where the peasants had use right of land and grazing rights of the commons, and periodically that land was redistributed. There was no private property. It was redistributed among the families. And, uh, and the craft guilds, where uh, workers owned tools, but they didn't, uh, but there was a communal control over sale, uh, of price and so on. Uh, and it's a memory of, of this kind of self-organized um, uh, uh, small societies uh, where there was a great deal of mutuality and mutual uh, help and, uh, and a desire to go back to that. Because in the process of capitalism emerging out of European feudalism, a great deal was lost. And the uh, the situation for most working people deteriorated horribly in Europe. And so this memory is not a false memory. Anarchism persists where feudalism was closest and had persisted the longest. First and foremost in Russia, for sure, with the, the peasant commune, the mir, 
which carried out the redistribution of land into the 1920s. It's amazing. That's probably why collectivization worked, actually, in Russia. Fairly worked, believe it or not. But there never was private property, basically. And, uh, but also in southern Italy and in southern Spain. This is where mass movements of anarchism persisted. The conditions where, where life was very close to feudalism and the memory of it was very, very strong. And the impulse is uh, to return to that. Uh, Marxism is very hard to find predecessors to Marxism. Extremely hard, if you really look at it, Bob Beth maybe, Moses Hess. There's some pieces, but really Marxism emerges with uh, industrial capitalism. Marx said that Marxism was the only ideology that could explain itself, and I think he was right. It's a product of industrial capitalism, of a new class that develops, that has potential power to eliminate capitalism. That would be the, the wage workers, and specifically the industrial workers. And uh, so this is a very, very, and, and, and coming out of this, is, is not the idea, I think, in Marxism, uh, is not the idea of eliminating uh, or ignoring. I think in anarchism, you have one or the other. You either have the urge to, uh, you know, the, the impulse to completely destroy the superstructure, the state, through violence, and then things will work out and fall into place, or kind of ignoring the state. The state doesn't exist. You, you don't pay attention to the state. You go somewhere else and do what you're doing, and, and not pay attention to the state. When they start to bother you, you bother them back, but you act as if it doesn't exist. And, um, and that is local. And people can make up their own ways of doing things and, and create their own uh, cultures and so on. This is very emotionally satisfying. I think my article on, on Italian anarchism, what I got out of it, I kind of sensed it, but I really got out of it, is how good it was for those people to have those communities. They live with great risk, uh, with very little to show for their, for their work, but they liked their lives, and they grew as people. They became very actualized, but they couldn't make any kind of lasting change. And they were swept aside in southern Italy and in the uh, little Italy's here in this country. Um, they couldn't save Sacquin Benzetti. That was the end of it, right there. And when the communists organized the defense, which could have worked if they had been allowed to start earlier, I think everyone kind of knew it was over. Two minutes. So, yes, thank you. And then, um, so I think the, the, the difference with Marxism is to supersede capitalism and, and, and incorporate as much of it as possible, the industrialization, the science, and even uh, the, 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 the better parts of bourgeois culture. That's been largely lost the great realist novels, uh, the great monumental classic works of, uh, of music, and that that's ours, it's not that, it's theirs. That, 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 was, that belongs to us, not to them. So, and I, so I think this is really, really quite different. And to organize, and it's about organizing the working class and later a sense of the allies of the working class to gain enough power in order to challenge capitalism but the organization of the workers and others has to do with uh, meeting immediate demands. And then based on immediate demands, taking people step by step, workers step by step, to see what's possible within the existing system and how at some point to overcome that, but having enough strength to actually accomplish that goal. The great um, theorist of, uh, of uh, anarchism, Mikhail Bakunin, is really at the heart of the whole thing. There's not a great deal else. There isn't a whole lot of variety. You have, uh, you have violent anarchism with Bakunin, and you do have pacifist, religious-based anarchism, like Peter Kropotkin, you know, Tolstoy, and so it's very, very interesting. Just one last, just to wrap it up, I think Lenin has to come into this at this point, but we don't have time for that right now, but I think what Lenin does is something that I think is largely missing in Marx, really, is, is a politics for, the, for bringing this about and having a theory of revolution. The collapse of socialism has caused an, uh, this incredible uh, you know, upsurge of interest in uh, anarchism. 
And I think our loss of uh, hope and loss of faith because of the collapse of Soviet yeah. Union and the, others, the rest of the socialist world, and now under our noses, the unraveling of social democracy, that we're terrified, we're weak, we don't, we've lost a hope, I think, in our own beliefs. But I think there is very, very little uh, hope for any, any kind of alliance with anarchism. I think it's antithetical, theoretically. Politically, it leads to a very different type of politics, and I think we should be more honest and forthright about that, and and create our own politics of organizing the workers, of organizing people, and getting a larger view so we can challenge the great power of the capitalist state and of bourgeois culture. Thank you very much. So, uh, so again, my name is Jose, and I'll try to, I, I was very active in Occupy Wall Street, and I'll probably try to reserve any Occupy types of comments to uh, the Q&A, you know, uh, and let them control that conversation for now. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about, I'll situate maybe the article that um, I submitted with uh, Linda to uh, Science and Society a little bit. Um, so it was, it, it's called Marxist Encounters with Anarchism. And, you know, uh, I think that a, a part of it was a frustration, and I have, you know, long had a frustration with a dogmatism and a fetishism that is endemic to both, I think, anarchist and, so, and Marxist uh, ways of thinking, which I don't think are so dichotomous, right? I think that it's easier for us to make them dichotomous um, then, uh, then if we actually understand the, the historical record of strategy and organizing, um, and especially the place that we're in right now. So we kind of looked uh, uh, at the history of Marxism and of communism and saw that there were a lot of periods of rupture. And those periods of rupture were places where other understandings of radical organizing and, and more libertarian or anti-authoritarian understandings of Marxism came about because there was suddenly a space or a frustration. There was either um, a lot more openness uh, towards struggle, sometimes in places that were very different from uh, Russia or other places. And then in other cases, there was a lot of disillusionment with uh, something that had happened in authoritarian socialism. So that is, you know, leaving the first international aside, it is the period during and after the Russian Revolution. It is, uh, it is the period where a lot of people became frustrated with Stalinism and Trotskyism um, in the late 30s. It is a period, uh, certainly when Stalin died and during the de-Stalinization period, and again in the 60s, and then again, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, in which we see branches in each of those of other attempts to formulate a Marxist politics. A Marxist politics around what some people were calling council communism and left communism in the direct and post-World War I era. And then some people resurrected that um, to try to understand what a Marxist politics could be in the 30s. And some people once again resurrected that in the 50s. Well, that's so well. um, and in the late 40s and the 50s, what we came to was, was talking about autonomism and autonomous Marxism as one of the most interesting and one of the more influential but least understood uh, anti-authoritarian Marxisms to exist in the English-speaking world. Because it doesn't come from the English-speaking world, people less often call themselves that, but the influence is nevertheless there. So, uh, so in the in the 50s, um, there were, and in the late 40s, there were a number of some ex-Trotskyists, some people who came from simply anti-Stalinist Marxist currents, uh, and it's not just in Italy and Greece, uh, Italy and Germany, but I think that the the, the dominant um, canonical works of autonomism are often noted to have been from from uh, England and Germany and Greece and, and uh, Italy. Um, but they have tried to formulate a different politics. They said the, the Leninist party doesn't work for us in our current situation. And in some of those cases, the Leninist party was massive. I mean, in Italy, coming out of World War II, it was very large, but very quickly turned into a, a social democratic politics around Eurocommunism. And they, and they were very frustrated with, with the limits or, or the, the, the dogmatism of Trotskyism. And they were very frustrated with Stalinism. And so they attempted to say, how do we create a worker-generated Marxism? How do we create a, a worker-generated revolutionary politics? 
And, you know, to cut it short, a lot of it was about understanding the changes in the, the working class so that it's not just an industrial proletariat in, in Western Europe at that point anymore. It's beginning to reformulate and reconstitute. And the, uh, I think autonomism had some role, but, but not a massive one in the United States, but certainly a bigger role uh, in Germany and Italy in this, coming out of the student movements of, um, wow, 10 minutes goes fast. Uh, uh, you know, coming out of the, the 60s and the, the uprisings in uh, Europe and in Japan in the 60s. So we tried to look at autonomism, something that really, really got big in the 70s and continued, and I think has a bigger impact in some ways on the politics of things like Occupy Wall Street and the counter-globalization movement, because especially coming out of the fall of the Soviet Union, people, you know, it, it's going to happen. Radical politics is going to reemerge, right? Some of it is going to emerge with the fetishism of an attempt to only look at the Spanish Civil War or statelessness or uh, uh, you know, the, the, the great icons of, and, and iconography of, of anarchism. And some of it is going to come out of the iconography or the, the, the dogmatism of people who are focused on geopolitics for so long. In the post-World War II, or in the, the post-Soviet breakup era, you can't talk about geopolitics in the same way as you could during the Soviet era. Right? And so some people in Latin America, uh, in, in Western Europe, and in many other parts of the world, I think had to reformulate an anti-capitalist politics because we no long, there was no longer a guiding force, Moscow or Beijing, to guide uh, revolutionary politics in the West or in Latin America. And, and you know, you'll find tons of Marxist parties in Africa also stopped calling themselves Marxist after this point. So radical politics in Africa also changed, especially at this point. Um, but in, in uh, Occupy Wall Street and in the counter-globalization movement, some of what happened by some sectors was an attempt to create prefigurative politics and create uh, autonomy and, and a lot of times refute the idea of national organization, which I don't think anarchism does, right, you know, all the time. I don't think that that is anarchism's prerogative or it's even its, its guiding principle to refute national or international organizing. I think autonomism engages with that a lot more because it's about not engaging in uh, trade union or parliamentary work ever. And anarchists sometimes get elected to things or certainly work for trade unions. Um, but, ref but, but saying that everything has to come from the ground up and we have to simply be uh, prefigurative examples for other groups. Which the problem with that is my understanding of prefiguration is that if you want to create models today, you also have to be engaging in, in the political struggle and the, the fight for political power, whatever that looks like, anarchist or communist, that, that, that Jackie was talking about, because you're only prefiguring once, you know, examples once we have taken power, once the workers or the 99% or the multitude or whatever we frame uh, the, the majority of the population and exploit people, um, that then we're recreating that on a, on a national or global or international scale. And autonomism, to some degree, refutes that and says we simply need to be uh, models in our local struggles, in our uh, autonomous social centers, and in our uh, anti-gentrification or immigrant rights or whatever struggles, um, anti-militarism struggles. So I think that uh, aut autonomism engaged in that to a great degree, and, and our struggles in the United States, having seen a left that had been so broken by first by McCarthyism, and then later by, by the repression of COINTELPRO in the 70s and the 80s, and then you know, later by, by uh, neoliberalization of our consciousness in, in this country, um, that it, it made sense, I think, that autonomism became a major thought. And it's not for us to simply dismiss it outright, even if we have a problem with it. Right? I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, helpful for us to be um, anti-anarchist in the, the Spanish or the Greek senses either because there is a politics in that place which allows it to, to, to uh, which allows self-organization and self-organization of struggles to sometimes be autonomous in nature. On the other hand, we can't look to autonomism to bring down feudalism and monarchy in Nepal in 2006. So I don't think that it's, we have to look at every single place with a prism of either Marxism, Leninism, or anarchism, and Bakuninism, or, or whatever our anarchism is, we have to look at different cir circumstances in different places. And in the, the Americas, in the United States especially, I think that autonomism has provided um, a great degree of, of organization and a great model, at the same time as it has proven its limits 
often being an uprising and presenting a great uh, pro uh, you know, area of process and of struggle for uprisings that don't necessarily lend themselves to long-term struggle and long-term organizing. Occupy Wall Street would not have been a great thing if it had been a Marxist, by the numbers, revolutionary organizing uh, uh, moment where we understood how to struggle for reforms in the furtherance of revolution. It wouldn't. Right? It was an uprising that required other things, and, and people needed other things to get them off the ground. And I was also in Spain during the Indignado and Quince Emma movement, and I think the same is true there. But, the, but it, like any uprising, offers us opportunities to come out of it in anarchist or Leninist or whatever other kinds of organizing, um, and to engage in other kinds of struggle that is more long-term, that will be sustainable, because it changes the discourse, and it changes what people think is possible. So um, that's where I'll leave it for now, and uh, maybe I'll get more into that kind of question when we get to q and Great. Thank you. So um, as there are different kinds of Marxism, there are different kinds of anarchism. So some of you may be surprised to hear that in many ways I agree with Jackie about a lot of what she's saying about a lot of the problems of Occupy Wall Street. I'll get into that in more detail in a moment. But um, some Marxists may find this an anarchist guilty pleasure. Anyway, um, so I identify with the anarchist communist and anarcho-syndicalist traditions within anarchism. I identify with the, the mass organizational end of the anarchist spectrum. Uh, as part of the Black Rose Anarchist Federation, we try to promote that perspective and disagree in some very substantial ways with certain sectors of, of the anarchist milieu, especially on the more insurrectionary anti-organizational end. So I think a number of the things that, that Jackie alluded to are to varying degrees ascribable to anarchists that I would disagree with. So maybe it would be a little more of a bitter argument if some of those folks were arguing with, with Jackie, but I'm going to partially agree and partially, of course, disagree. Um, so the question is, is not whether or not anarchists were involved in Occupy in New York. I think that we can all agree that they were very involved. The question is whether the problems that Occupy encountered, to what extent were they ascribable to anarchism writ large, and to what extent were the successes of Occupy ascribable to anarchism writ large. So I think that, that there is a paradoxical truth about the influence of what David Graeber and some other folks have referred to as small a anarchism within Occupy New York. And just to, to give a little context of what I mean by that, folks that are interested in consensus decision making, uh, um, autonomous organizational structures, and so forth. So like in contrast, I'm not especially interested in defending consensus. I think there are times when it can be useful, times when majority voting is more useful. I think that the way that autonomy was theorized within Occupy was often really just to sort of create small cliques of people who didn't want to be accountable. I disagree with that too. My vision of social transformation is through larger federal structures which have delegates that could coordinate at a larger level, but delegates different from representatives insofar as the decision-making authority would still be grounded at the local level and they would simply articulate decisions made at a local level. So that's the way that, for example, historically, anarcho-syndicalist labor confederations of hundreds of thousands of workers have been able to coordinate actions at a larger level and therefore avoid the kind of small autonomy uh, localism that Jackie referred to, which I equally am critical of. While I'm on the subject, before I get back to the Occupy thing, I think it's also worth bearing in mind that while anarchism originally did uh, find a lot of support in relatively underdeveloped parts of Southern Europe, we need to also remember that another important period in anarchist history was the 1920s and 30s, where some of these anarcho-syndicalist unions had hundreds of thousands of members in Germany, in France, and even in industrialized parts of Italy and Catalonia and Spain, which was one of the more industrialized part of the country. So yeah, the sort of old cliche of 1960s anti-anarchist historians that it was exclusively rural is not true. And of course, also Marxists have had great support in rural areas too. So I think the dichotomy is a little overdone. Anyway, going back to <laughs> Occupy. Um, we'll be right along. Yeah, of course. Um, so, so I agree with Jackie on a lot of things. and. And I think that, that what I try to promote in the book and what some other like-minded anarchists try to promote with Occupy is to think about the ways in which uh, what was done with Occupy could have been done better. So as Jose said, I do think that the notion that Occupy could have been done simply by the institutional left is not true. So what I'm trying to make is a sort of paradoxical argument that the horizontalism within Occupy was a necessary means to get Occupy going, but implied limitations. 
limitations which I would not ascribe to anarchism because I subscribe to a form of anarchism that I think has some lessons that could help make assemblies, decision-making bodies, direct actions a bit better. And so I think that we, in this conversation we shouldn't simply say anarchism or Marxism, this or that, without being specific to the situation, and specific to what sort of strands within it we're referring to. Uh, just a little bit on, uh, on anarchist history. Um, I would disagree with the notion that anarchism goes back quite as far as uh, Gerald, is it? Um, uh, 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 said, I, I mean, there's a book called Black Flame by Lucien Vanderwalt and Michael Schmidt. I agree a little more with their notion that it really is around the Bakunin that you get what we really refer to as anarchism. The stuff earlier, the romantic stuff, I would cart off to the side as being pre-anarchist. And so then the notion that the, the state, the, the anarchist goal is to simply destroy the state and everything else would follow is not true. And I don't know of anyone from eight, the 1870s onward that's a significant anarchist theorist that would have said that. Uh, one of the benefits of anarchism is its holistic perspective on oppression in general. One of the limitations of classical Marxism uh, and limitations to some extent on early anarchism is the exclusive, well not exclusive, but primary focus on class. And I think that anarchism has, easier, has an easier time dealing with an intersectional holistic view of oppression simply because it doesn't, it's not tied to the original um, baggage sometimes of uh, historical materialism. Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah, well, um, by all means. Um, and also just to uh, refer to a few other, our, a few other comments, since we're, we're getting into it a little. Um, the notion that uh, a federal structure wouldn't be able to deal with Hitler implies that what deal, did deal with Hitler was like a good thing, and if, if we're into praising Stalinist Russia, then, then I don't have much to say about that. That was kind of, we should all agree that was not good. Okay, that was not good. Uh, um, moving along, um, what else do we get here? The notion that uh, prefigurative politics is utopian, I think it depends on what kind of prefigurative politics. Certainly we all want to, to some extent, embody what we're, in what we're doing how we want things to be. The question is, to what extent do we think that we can prefigure the future world here and now? Uh, Anarchists might be a little more optimistic about that than some Marxists, but I, I think that most anarchists of my tendency would disagree with the notion that we can just make things how we want right now. Clearly, we need the social struggle and the social struggle and the prefigurative struggle at the same time, complementing each other. We can't simply make the world we want and hope that it'll expand. So I disagree with that. Prominent mentality within Occupy as well. Um, what else do we got here? Um, the notion that anarchists are romantic and, um, what else was the other word? Romantic and emotional, it kind of makes me feel nice. <laughs> romantic and emotional. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice, you know. What's wrong with that? No, no in all seriousness, um, I do think that if you read a lot of the theorists of anarchism in the beginning of the 20th century, there is a heavy focus on technology, futurism, all the kind of shortcomings of a, of a positivist modernism that you find with Marxism and all sorts of left struggle in the beginning of the 20th century. So we weren't immune from that either. Um, uh, what else we got here? Uh, the issue of being scalable, once again, I think is largely attributable to the sort of uh, small a anarchist milieu, which I would disagree with. Anarchists have had large internationals that have been relatively significant on a, on a world scale. I don't have much to say to your thing because I, I pretty much agree with most of that. Um, regarding the question of anarchists and Marxists working together, I think that it can happen. It has happened. It will continue to happen. It's happening all around the world. So it's not as if it's like a question of can it. The question is like what would that look like and, and how can we make it happen better. Um, I think that obviously it's important within the anarchist milieu to push back against the excessively individualist anti-organizational strains, which are often quite counterproductive. I think within the Marxist milieu, the, the baggage of authoritarianism needs to be discarded. I think much of what happened in the quote-unquote really existing socialist countries of the 20th century was the worst setback for socialism that history has seen. That the notion that you know these hierarchical regimes that had very little input of the working class at all and how they function was actually the embodiment of socialism is what makes a lot of people run away when they hear the word. Uh, I welcome comments and feedback on that notion. Um, and to wrap up, uh, so I think that essentially anarchists can kind of get rid of the individualist thing. 
uh, Marxists can get rid of some of the authoritarianism, we can find ourselves somewhere in the middle uh, without having to give up what we believe at a core value, and we can continue to be fun and romantic, and you can be scientists all day long, and we'll be fun together. And um, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. and then we will go back and allow the panelists to respond um, to the questions and to one another. If you have a question that's addressed to a specific panelist, please make that clear um, in your comments. So let's start with you there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, during the sick, first of all, I have, I have two comments. One is, that to me, there's a collapsing of categories in this whole discussion between analysis and politics that you've collapsed them both in a way that doesn't help this discussion. So that's A. B, my own life was that I learned Marxism through an anarchist, which was Murray Bookchin. I was part of a group called Anarchos during the 60s, which had an enormous, even though it was a small group, had an enormous effect in terms of moving the left, particularly SDS, away from the kind of neo, I don't know, neo-Stalinist, Maoist tendencies that ended up that I, would, I believe contributing to the destruction of the left in the United States. But the point that I'm getting with Murray, and I really recommend his work to people if you don't know him, he wrote a book which was really quite compelling called Post-Scarcity Anarchism, which tried to situate the possibilities within the actual material conditions. He was a Marxist at heart. He broke from the party because of because his felonies. He tried to understand what's possible based upon the material analytic Marxist conditions that he saw, which I believe are still valid today, which is basically you live in a post-scarcity world. And we're forced to, uh, the tyranny of capitalism is to strip us of our wealth and redistribute it to the 1%. We would have a very different life and different forms of social organization if we could redistribute wealth. So I would love to hear you guys talking about the actual material conditions under which we live, call it anarchist analysis or Marxist analysis, it's the really starting point that no one wants to talk about. Okay. Um, question back there? Yes. One comment, one question. Comment. I think the bourgeoisie was terrified of Occupy. When we see the Smith Act victims, they were tried and put away for years. With the Black Panthers, they were just murdered and mown down. With Occupy, the cops beat white women, young white women, repeatedly, repeatedly. So that indicated that they were frightened. OK, the question. No one has mentioned horizontalism. Who mentioned horizontalism? Three of them. Horizontalism. I don't remember if I did use that word. So what's the question? On horizontalism, how does it change society, or is there no goal in anarchism to actually change society? Do we just live in what we make? OK, a couple more comments. Way back there, yes? Yeah, uh, two things. things. On politics, you've got to realize there's going to be some government in a new society. So politically, what you're going to do is eliminate eight separate military classes by having a popular militia instead of army or in police, and you're going to eliminate political classes by eliminating special political parties, uh, as a, a, a separate whole political class, as, and uh, the, this is politically in terms of anarchism, and, but also oh, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, Marxism, um, as well, and uh, this is why you have to have it in a small, decentralized is the structure that would be con uh, confederal. Also, when it comes to economics, you have to 
have the property question addressed. You need social property. That means those who work the means of production, own the means of production, and in, 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 in terms of transfer of wealth, you have to get rid of market relations and put in some kind of what's called full communism um, or non-market transfer of goods such as rationing, time chip coupons, did you have a, did you have a something question? like that. Well, the whole point is, isn't this a good kind of very basic program that you could unite Marxists and anarchists around by going to the very basic core issues rather than getting hung up on all these sectarian squabbles in, in which each side tries to prove who, how much better they are than and the other or by uh, going against them on a pure sectarian basis. Okay, good. One more question? Yes. Yeah, the question is, um, did, did the influence of anarchism occupy make it, is that the reason it did not develop like Podemos? Okay, is that it? That's the question. Okay. So, do we want to start on this side and work over that way? I'll take the last one. Um, Podemos was partly created by uh, the people who occupied the squares in Spain, but unlike New York, they re recognized that they needed to have uh, institutions that could uh, uh, organize the power of a uh, broader population. And uh, we'll have to just watch and see. <laughs> we'll just have to watch and see how effective uh, these uh, groups going into uh, governments in capitalist countries uh, can be. Uh, I have doubts about, I mean, Syriza looks like, I mean, it's good that they are resisting, you know, the U EU's uh, attempt to destroy them with debt, but, uh, we have to wait and see whether that is an adequate uh, strategy for actually being able to resist, um, rather than some kind of, uh, you know, uh, economic revolt <laughs> at, uh, you know, the points where uh, there is some power among the workers. I loved your question. I, I think that uh, what they most the, the leadership and a lot of its base came out of the Spanish Communist Party. They either were members of the party or came from party families. The same is true in Syriza. The same. Uh, you see the same thing. Uh, the left parties in Germany that come out of the communist tradition, the GDR, and and so I, I think the difference being that is is with fetishizing. I, hate that word, you know, because I was in therapy all my life, you know, but, <laughs> you know, and, but I'm here, you know, I'm not happy, but I am here, you know, <laughs> I'm never happy, happy never happy, but I'm here, but, uh, <laughs> no, 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 still some talk, you know, not a lot, but in any case, but I think that uh, what really is in every situation, I think we're getting overly specific here, really. I, I, you know, I think it's just a terrible mistake. It's a mistake to fetishize any tactic. It's just a terrible mistake. Tactics are tactics. Tactics relate to strategy, which was missing totally from what occurred. And, uh, and the strategy depends on what you're able to do. There's a longer term strategy, and then there's the adjustment to that depending on what forces you have how powerful the other side is, how vicious they might be at the moment. And all these adjustments have to occur in order that any progress at all will be made, or that you're not smashed to smithere smithereens, so that we're collecting money from defense funds, and everybody said, I've had enough of this, I have children, I have a job, I gotta get a haircut, whatever. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's to, to say, to, 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 to bring that, the, the, this is nothing new. There are all kinds of occupations in the city. To, you know, to occupy uh, the dean's office, the president of the university's office. 
they kicked out waiters for sure. They're getting paid. They're all getting paid. They move the telephone to another room and they wait. And, and, and uh, more and more people that have a life, they go, you know, they have to, you know, take care of this or take care of that, go to their job, their kids, whatever they're doing. And the people that are left are more and more, uh, frankly, very often unstable or unrepresentative. And then finally they're swept out and that's it. It's not, it's not a strategy. It's a tactic which can have value. The, uh, the sit-ins during uh, the, the CIO, the organization the CIO, it's one thing you're sitting in and you're there with their property and they can't make profit. That's quite different than sitting in a park that nobody ever used or sitting in a dean's office where uh, nothing's, nothing. There's, nothing, there's nothing that occurs from that. It's really, to, it's really to, to, that the, 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 strat the tactics have to be adjusted to the goals, what people have, to, to, you know, in terms of bringing into that fight. And uh, with Podemos, it was very clear what they wanted, Sumisa too, a political party that would have a connection between the social movement and a, a genuine political party with a program, uh, with a short-term, long-term program. And, you know, we could argue, are they right or wrong? You know, we shouldn't try that right now. I think, you know, Podemos and Cerise and so on, they're not, they shouldn't get too gaga over any of it, perhaps, and just hope for the best for them, because it's about human life and human, you know, existence and democracy. But, but the, the it, it's, let's not reify this. I mean, to go into this and do an autopsy on something that happened, and it'll happen again, and other things will happen. My take is, is that that is coming out of anarchism it's very, very largely. It's highly local, there's a, a very extreme interest in the figurative stuff, it's horizontal, uh, it, it really feeds into full-time activist stuff. I think it's very masculine, by the way. And I think people that have certain skills, you know, a certain familiarity with uh, argumentation and deliberation, and disputation when other people get tired, they move back, they go home, they just fight with one another, and look, it doesn't work. I think what right now, under our noses, is a fabulous, fabulous movement to uh, organize low-income workers and to get and to increase the minimum wage. We shouldn't sit in a spot and ask the people to come to look at us. We got to do is go to where the people are to go to the Bronx, to go to East New York, and help, and help people use our skills and our knowledge and our resources to help working people and poor people and minority people to begin to fight to get what they deserve. Uh, first of all, that last thing, I mean, I think that that's a false dichotomy. Again, I think that you don't just engage in local struggle. We do a lot of that kind of local struggle around, you know, in cities that I've lived in, Chicago and New York. You also have to confront the system and the structure and do high profile things. And then you have to know how to be able to go back. And in many cases, uh, in New York to a, to a certain degree in Sunset Park and Crown Heights, um, but, and, and in the Bronx, in certain parts of the South Bronx, there, there were people who went back from Occupy Wall Street in the epicenter in Wall Street back to their communities. But, uh, and I think in some other cities they were much better at that. But uh, really, really quickly, so, so to, to move to the questions, I like to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld. Um, <laughs> you don't go to war with the left you would like to have or you would want to have at a later time. You go to war with the left that you have, right? And I think that we build from the left that we have. So to understand the, 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 the development of Podemos, is to understand a that there were divisions within indic the indignado struggle, of that were where there were occupations in about 50 different cities across Spain, and in some of those places anarchists predominated, in other places a different kind of politics, and in other places a different kind of anti-authoritarian po politics like autonomism and autogestionistas, self-management uh, organizing. And from some sectors of that that had more inclination anyway towards electoral politics and towards political struggle, um, 
the Podemos came out, right? So I think that I think that uh, one of the things that's interesting in Germany, where I I had written a lot in the article, we wrote a lot on Germany, but now I just went to Germany for a month and saw that the autonomous movement has shifted to some degree from being so completely opposed to parliamentary politics 100% and trade union politics 100%. Now there is the autonoma. Um, movements that still exist very highly local, fighting gentrification, housing struggles, immigration and racism struggles. And now there is a big wing that has become national known as the, the, the post-autonomous left with the unfortunate name of the, le uh, left in, uh, the left interventionists, or the interventionist left, which doesn't sound very good in English, but to them they are anti-authoritarians who believe that they need to have a relationship with the rest of the left, the, the electoral and parliamentary um, left. I think in, in Greece, you know, Syriza predates 2008, the big uprising there, um, but certainly got bigger after that to some degree. And, you know, so I think that what we're building here, and, you know, Rojava, I mean, we do have examples of Bookchin. Bookchin isn't just something that, you know, exists in, in books in the United States. There are Marxist-Leninists and people who have some, some degree of malice politics who said, maybe we can learn something from Bookchin and try to figure out a new uh, politics in northern Syria. Because when we talk about anarchism and Marxism, when we talk about political power, and I think that that's often a, one of the big debates between the different tendencies, uh, we don't always disagree on what political power looks like. Sometimes we agree it's the Paris Commune, or it's the Workers' Councils, or it's the, the, the confederal, it's confederalism of, uh, or the municipal, uh, whatever they call it, um, um, in, in Rojava, in northern Syria. I think that often we're fighting for the same kind of political power. We, 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 we have divisions on how to get there, or we have divisions on our names. And that doesn't help us build a left in the United States that understands where the working class is, and the precarity of the working class, the, the low wage level of so many sections of the working class, and how to organize communities that are less and less industrialized and less and less have a mass manufacturing base, but also can't, aren't going to achieve any kind of political power out of lifestyleist hanging out in a punk scene um, all day and, and uh, being pure, right? So, so I think that to the question of horizontalism, right, like I think that horizontalism is a miss translation because in Latin America very few people call themselves horizontalistas you know it's it's horizontality mm -hmm. and to my mind what these kinds of anti-authoritarian uh, things like horizontality offer us is an aspiration that our organizing and our political power that we're trying to create should look like it's an aspiration that we we're not going to attain but we should attempt to do organizing amongst workers and in our communities in anti-gentrification struggles or against deportation or police violence that aspires towards horizontalism and uh, horizontality and a more democratic framework so that it can actually come from people in the community. But I think that, I think that we, we, if we talk too much about these kinds of words in the nomenclature, I think you're exactly right. We don't talk about the politics of, of real struggle and how people are actually struggling in the United States today. And some of that is low-wage struggle, and that is, if that is trade unions that are furthering the low-wage struggle, that's great and we need to get behind that, period. And on the other hand, if it is, uh, if it is you know, a, a slew of anti-authoritarian black politics that is doing really amazing work in Black Lives Matter, we need to get behind that and fight f you know, against police violence, and I would say fight to abolish the police and prisons, um, in a struggle, you know, that is currently happening right now, not aspire towards some kind of organization that is Leninist, Maoist, anarcho-syndicalist that doesn't presently exist, right? We can, we can try to move the, the, the actual movements in those directions, but we have to look where people are right now and where the momentum is and where the struggle is and then formulate our struggle out of what currently is. Um, so, uh, was the influence of anarchists in Occupy why we didn't get an equivalent of Podemos? I think it largely is really just because it's hard to form third parties in the United States. If it had been easier, someone probably would have done that. Um, I'm, I'm not psyched with Podemos, surprise. Um, 
And I, I, but I'm sort of a little puzzled at the degree to which like revolutionary Marxists get excited by parties like Podemos, which are really relatively moderate and have yeah, moved yeah. to be even more moderate. Recently, a number of key figures in, on the left of Podemos resigned. They gave up on promises for guaranteed minimum income, uh, reducing the retirement age from 65 to 60. They've tried to drift to the center and portray themselves as apolitical to get more support. Yeah. Um, whereas like Syriza, I mean, still don't like parties, but like they're a left party. Pretty more, much more straightforward. Um, and the question of horizontalism: Do anarchists want to change society? Yes. To, <laughs> um, no, but to elaborate, um, you know, the, the anarchist goal is a social revolution that, in the process, targets all forms of oppression and hierarchy, without necessarily prioritizing any one over the other. Um, so anarchists want to do lots of changes and all at the same time and really fast. <laughs> so, so we want lots of change. Say what you will about us, we do want change. Um, the question of redistributive wealth, um, I mean obviously um, there's reason to be cautious when we describe exactly what the future society would look like and exactly how to get there because obviously historical circumstances will dictate what that would look like. But um, I do think that in many ways how Marxists and anarchists see getting there is not all that different. I think some of the key differences are what role a political party should have in doing that. We're not so fond of that. Uh, at least traditional Marxists are more fond of it, but obviously there are Marxists who are not. Uh, and to what extent should um, a relatively small group of supposedly more politically intelligent people have a role in telling us how to get there? Um, not a fan of that didn't work out so hot. Um, and uh, the question, uh, I think those are all three questions, right? That's all three questions, okay. Okay, can I start over here? Yeah. Sure. Okay, Occupy certainly did have strategy. The question was about how does one go about developing the strategy? So Occupy had working groups in which people could get together and develop together a strategy for approaching anything at all that the people there wanted to do. Now, whether it was good or bad is something else, but to say that it didn't have any strategy at all, I think is wrong. And that contrasts the way we are, how does strategy come about in most of the existing uh, Marxist-Leninist groups, right, which is usually top-down. It's usually said, here is our strategy, and then with some minor discussion. That's why a lot of people left the Communist Party, a lot of people in this room, right? who left the Communist Party because they didn't like the authoritarian, the lack of democracy in it. Don't point at me. I'm not pointing at you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but the video is actually good. So, so that's one. The second thing is I agree that there's, a, analytically speaking, looking historically, I think there's a false dichotomy being made between what anarchism and Marxism, actually, because it depends what question you're asking. If you're talking about how do we overthrow capitalism, or how do we analyze capitalism, then of course Marxism speaks to that directly. It speaks to exploitation. And the anarchism looks at the state historically as having a separate trajectory, right, historically, and it speaks to oppression and patriarchy, but it doesn't speak to exploitation. Right, so, but today when we look at, so, so these took separate paths, but today where the state is the corporation, is, is the corporate structure, is the capitalist structure, then there's no, at least for now, there's a total confluence of both, and it's, I think it's a silly argument to redo all this um, in the way we're doing it without, just without looking at how those are congruent today. And, to put, uh, and it's creating a false dichotomy. I had one more uh, point, but I will skip it, because otherwise I'll get just. <laughs> I like to be happy. Um, so, I'm gonna speak for several people in this room who are under 45, and most of them are on Twitter talking to each other at the moment. This is absurd. This is terrible. Uh, hi, Jeff. Um, I can't believe what I'm hearing. <laughs> this is like absurd. Why? Um, because you're talking about why people left the Communist Party before the rest of us were even born. 
those of us who are currently like doing work on the street, and I'm so sick of talking about the occupation. Uh, I was there, by the way. Um, so if we could please like move on and just like not in this room, but like as a whole, um, and also that you know I'm here with like Chepe and our friends. So I'm an anarchist and he's a communist, and we talk about this stuff a lot. Uh, and so like. We actually don't find that much in um, opposition to each other, or at least the things that we find in points different are things that, like, should all our wildest dreams come true, we're not going to get to for a hundred years. So why argue about them now? <laughs> all right, all right. Yes. Um, I think the, the points that were made that there are different versions and interpretations of anarchism and of Marxism is very important. Um, I think in some cases, uh, if the views are um, too far to one side for either one, um, there's going to be no connection and conflict and so on. But I do think that if other uh, pieces of or, or interpretations of Marxism and anarchism, um, I think there's some common ground where they can meet. Um, an example would be, um, I got uh, initially politicized in the New Left in the 60s, um, had kind of went, broke away from that because it seemed too disorganized to me, and I became a Marxist and joined the Communist Party. Um, I have been a trade unionist my whole life, and I wouldn't say that I rejected everything from the New Left and from the anarchists in the New Left, um, I tried to incorporate that into my, what I viewed, the work that I did in the trade union movement, but through my Marxist lens. So for example, what I tried to do is build stewards councils, um, organized from the bottom up, in every single work area in whatever facility we, you know, were representing workers. Um, and so, it, so there was a bottom up component to it, where the workers themselves decided what the issues were, I didn't come in and say, oh, you know, I think the main issue is this. I asked them, what do you think the main issue is here? And then they would talk among themselves and figure out what it was, and then that became the issue. Whether I thought it was the main issue or not was irrelevant. And then we built a structure so that we would have a permanent organization that continued, but the permanent structure was built on the basis of that work group decided who they wanted to be their union steward, or if they wanted two, or if they wanted three. We made it flexible so that if more than one person wanted to step forward and take some leadership responsibility, they could do that. But it was done from the bottom up, but we still created structure so that we could accomplish things in a timely way, and uh, it worked. So, uh, Jackie, I remember you saying, I think, during Occupy, there wasn't really an economic analysis, or at least the... Not a systematic yeah, analysis, right. no. So, no. All hierarchies were equal. Right. So, and it was good that other hierarchies were addressed like gender, but nothing was prioritized at, out of an analysis. So, so I just wanted to say, at least in my experience in anarchist circles, is that I think there's a degree to which we take for granted Marxist analysis of economics, that it's just something that we agree with, and don't spend much time debating or not analyzing ourselves. And I'm wondering, Mark, if you say that's the case, and whether or not you think that's a problem, problem that we, we in, in anarchist circles don't spend that much time um, analyzing um, the economy the in the way that the, the Marxist tradition. That's why they don't spend a lot of time talking about it. And I'm wondering if that's just and because it's associated with uh, the academy and professionalism. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, that's actually a good, um, very that last good question point. is good because it actually brings us back to, I believe it was the very first question that was raised, and as far as I know, it wasn't actually addressed by the panel, which was a question, I'm not sure if I'm getting the words right, but about whether we weren't mixing up um, strategy and theory here, that is to say, there's one issue about politics and then there's another issue about theoretical analysis. And in talking about the difference between Marxism and anarchism, we're not distinguishing those enough. And I would be interested in hearing any reflections that any of you have about the theoretical premises and the differences there as well. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, wait. Yeah. Let's. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. You want to you want to start us off? No, that's okay. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I, I think there are really serious differences, uh, and uh, I think um, I think you're right. By the way, I think that uh, anarchism uh, didn't develop a separate political economy. I mean, that was taken for granted. And there are other. Uh, there, I mean, this is argumentation. It's polemical. The, the things get a little extreme, and you work back from there. But but there really are differences. But but I. Uh, I think in, in the, the, my article in Science and Society, a lot of it came out of a wonderful book that was written about uh, Italian radical culture in um, the United States. And I think the really kind of a discovery of the, of the author, Marcello Benciveni, was uh, that the anarchists, the communists, and the socialists all shared the same culture. They all read Zola. They all saw the same plays. They all, you know, I mean, there are these commonalities, and I, I wouldn't want to deny them. I'd love to just, if you don't mind, just, I, I, I don't know your name, wonderful. Oh, I'd like to have a beard like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but I know in my own practical work, I am very interested in some configuration. There are so many nasty, nasty Marxists that don't, wouldn't give you the time of day, no social sense. We've never imagined showing, sending a sympathy card, or they don't know what Father's Day is. I mean, they're just dreadful people. You know, uh, so I would do, I, I think, I, and, and then apparently. to go out into the world, you know, purporting uh, to, you know, uh, to represent uh, this uh, wonderful society that we hope for while criticizing everything that's under one's nose really doesn't make us look very good or win us very many adherents, very many followers. But but I, I think that the key, in some ways, Marxism coming out of the political economy, but I think also in the, uh, the historiography, is class, the primacy of class. And I, and I think what's happened now is that's moved away, even in the, the slogan of the 1%, yeah. rather than saying the working class, what the fuck is wrong with saying the working class? God damn it, you know? I mean, it's infuriating. It's, it's, not, it's not real, it's not true, it doesn't teach anything. All the great slogans taught, they embodied some powerful truth, whether it's in a religion, by the way, or in a political ideology. There were powerful paradoxes that people that didn't have a great deal of formal education could hold on to, incorporate, work with the one percent. My big toe. You know, it's not. It's about class. It's about the capitalist class. It's about the working class. It's about ownership. It's not about income and wealth. It's about ownership. And our work always, with what, what distinguishes us from liberals, I think, is our work must always involve education. Every step we take, every move, is always very clear. We're doing this in a way that we're moving forward consciousness. The consciousness cannot just develop spontaneously. It develops from, uh, you know, from uh, sharing people that's had this experience with others and then are enriching our own experience that we can carry along with others. Everything doesn't come from the ground up. You know, uh, Mar Marxist uh, political theory did not develop from the ground up. When I was looking for predecessors to Marxism, you know where you find them? In conservative ideology, Hegel. You know, you find it in Adam Smith. That's the predecessors that he transformed. I mean, it doesn't come all from the ground up. That's inane. It, it, it's, it's not true. Uh, so I think we have to be a little careful. So, so I think that coming out of the theory, it, it, there is a, uh, an expression of where we should go. And I think where we, where we go is, in Marxism, nothing exists without agency. Uh, Marx said somewhere that a problem does not exist until the solution is at hand. The solution was the working class. The solution was at hand. We have a responsibility to take our knowledge, our experience, and share that with people desperately need change. Breck said revolution is not for those who want change, it's for those who need change. 
And this is our life. I think this is what we've chosen, to be communists, to be political people. And that's our job. That's our mission. And how do we do that? How do we do that? So uh, I, I, so thank you, that's all. Uh, okay, so a, a few, uh, two quick points and then one longer one. On the question of the, the idea that there's multiple Marxisms, I think that it's, it's a good point and it's a salient point in an age of, you know, Syriza Podemos, uh, the KPD of Germany versus Dielinka, the, you know, all these various parties, that there is, there is such a thing as a Marxist party that's not Leninist. And I think that we need, I think that we need, I think Lenin is a great revolutionary influence that we should study, but I think that Leninism has had its day, and that there is a possibility for a Marxist politics and for a Marxist party making that is not Leninist. Um, and we need to think about that more. Right now, that predates Mark Lenin, that was during Lenin, that was after Lenin, who was fighting you know, an authoritarian feudal regime in completely different circumstances than we're fighting in the United States today. Um, uh, the, the next quick thing is, I forgot almost to say that anar this, this, this conversation that's happened about anarchism is better equipped to talk about oppressions. Uh, is, I think it's interesting in the lieu of the history of uh, the great uh, feminist and black and Latino and Latin American and African and Asian thought and indigenous thought that comes out of Marxism to talk about a pre racial, national, gender oppression, right? So that if we look at CLR James and Selma James, if we look at Simone de Beauvoir um, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, France Fanon and Amilcar Cabral and any number of some of the most important theorists whose theory is still applicable and relevant to questions of race, nation, and gender, and intersectionality, the, this comes out of Marxist thought, right? So I don't, you know, I think that, I think that that was, I just wanted to set the record straight that anarchism didn't get it right. We often have to look to communists, including Maoists, to find it. Um, but on the question of class analysis of, of, of anarchists, for one thing, who does the interesting class politics and class interrogative work. And this is one of the things that makes me interested in autonomism. I think that there was a lot of anti-authoritarian Marxist groups that said that the, the, the working class looks different. We have to talk about the working class. We have to talk about it as a context of ownership and power relations, not a conversation about income level. And I think that if we talk about the 99% too much, and we refuse to talk about the class coalition that that looks like in one of our parks or in our organizing, then we're only talking about income, we're talking about symptom, and when we fall into liberalism, we don't have a real radical politics um, that understands ownership and power. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, I think that the problem of making the assumption that we understand the class analysis is A, that class has changed. And the relationship between class, race, nation, and gender has always been, you know, complex and has been changing. And so having a class analysis doesn't mean that you have a full class analysis, or a contemporary class analysis, or a strategy around having a full or contemporary class analysis. And I think the problem of, of, of anarchism and, and a lot of anti-authoritarianism in the West is that if we claim to assume that Marxism is, a, is generally authoritarian, but we all have the same class analysis, it allows us on one side to be in academia and to really get our stuff perfect in academia outside of the sphere of real politics and of practice. And on the other side, to have people in the streets who are doing really important organizing or the organizing of today in, you know, anywhere in Western Europe or the United States or in certain parts of like Brazil um, that is dissociated from theory and becomes anti-intellectual. And, it, you know, I think that it breaks the, the dialectical relationship of theory and practice. We have to continue to talk about the theory. We have to understand the theory. We also have to understand that the theory is developed long past Marxism before we, we make an assumption that we simply all agree on. Because making the assumption leaves a lot of, uh, in my experience over the last 16 years, it leaves a lot of people fighting in radical queer movements, in Occupy Wall Street, in counter-globalization movement, immigrant rights movement, the anti-war movement, the anti-cop movements, and so many others. Uh, having a language that came from academia, 
or, or from radical organizing, but not knowing where the language came from or what it truly means, and then fighting over language in the streets without the, the theory that is relevant to it, and without understanding how language should, you know, was meant to be applied to the practical situation. And on the other hand, people creating language in academia completely not understanding where the world's politics are, where the, the, where the struggle is, where the momentum for resistance is, whether that's Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matter. It makes it easy to dismiss Black Lives Matter or Occupy Wall Street, or to dismiss the Indignado movement, or, the, or Antarsia, the extra-parliamentary left of Greece, rather than you know, actually contend with what's the relationship between those fighting for political power, whatever that looks like, and the struggle on the bottom. Um, so you know, I think that sometimes we have to name it. That's, that's it. Sure. Um, so the question of Marxist economics related to anarchism, yeah, I mean, to a large extent, 19th century anarchists adopted a lot of what Marx thought, because Marx thought a lot of great stuff. Um, there have been debates within anarchism over the past hundred and so, so odd years as to the degree to which anarchists ought to lean on what Marx says about economics. It goes back and forth. I don't really have a strong opinion on that. Um, I think that a lot of anarchists and anarchist movements historically have had a more of a voluntaristic focus on social change and have been less concerned about the kinds of macro structures that Marxists like to think about and more focused on what they're going to do to try and get there, um, which has, has its pros and cons, because sometimes obviously you can, you can under theorize, but you can also over theorize. Um, Figures like Kropotkin have talked a lot about economics from a different angle, his focus on mutual aid, which he thought of as different than how it's sometimes been applied today. Um, but I do agree with the, essentially the comments that there's a lot that we can be doing together, and there's a lot of areas of overlap, and I don't see us getting anywhere without doing some of that. Um, so, and then the one other thing about the sort of common premise, the, the, the premises of, of Marxism and anarchism is that Anarchists have been attacked by this for Marxists, but generally the anarchist critique has been an ethical critique about morality, about what we ought to be doing as human beings, how we ought to be living. And that, of course, is different from the, the traditional classical Marxist focus on you know, material questions and so forth. Um, but I, I, don't, I still think that there, there's still an ethical angle to Marxism, so I think that's often overstated too. Um, but uh, that, that's all for now. Um, first, I, I just want to say this is a great panel. It's wonderful to have a, a real dialogue. It's a great panel. It's wonderful to have a real dialogue. Not everybody is agreeing, clearly. Uh, but that people are being at least relatively respectful of each other. Uh, this is quite remarkable. We're trying. <laughs> Especially with anarchists and Marxists. Um, so I, I actually want to follow up the last couple of comments. Uh, comments from, from the people on the podium, um, having to do with the, with the overlaps and the differences between Marxism and anarchism, uh, and suggest that it's not going to be very simple to really, to really tease that out, because I think, as Jose said, Marxists are very concerned with oppression. And um, a lot of anarchists are very concerned with exploitation. I mean, we can talk about money. Bookchin, we could talk in France about Daniel Guerin or Andre Gors. I mean, yeah. these, these are not mutually exclusive categories. Um, and um, it seems to me that maybe the cutting edge may ultimately be not in the possibility of working together and coming up with common strategies, but how you actually envision what you want. So that it seems to me Marxists are going to have a hard job of addressing questions of bureaucracy and hierarchy and authoritarianism. And anarchists are going to have a hard job trying to talk about how you construct a national framework, or maybe a transnational framework, in which you create a socialist economy uh, without coercive power. Or if they're going to be coercive power, then how does that work in terms of anarchism? Who else wants to get in on this? Yes. No, uh, like Jose, I have an interesting uh, family background. 
my parents were both anarchists and immigrants from, so, so from Russia uh, and uh, born and brought up in an anarchist community in still New Jersey, which was, I want to talk to you about it, uh, which was uh, formed around modern school, which was one of the uh, primary things that happened in Spain in the 1909, uh, when Francisco Ferrer was murdered by the state and the church uh, for his educational which was like the head, girls and boys sat in the same room. Uh, that was the basis. They wouldn't let him have a school system where they, they were not trained in the church. And literally the, the kids could not sit together. Uh, November of 2009, I went to Barcelona with a group of, 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 of uh, alumni of the mod career modern school uh, for a dedication of a monument to Francis Ferrer. I've got pictures. <laughs> So I don't really see all that big a difference, uh, you know, from the past. Now the Leninist model, uh, I, uh, I think in the sense that uh, the Leninist model doesn't romanticize the masses, which I think the anarchist position does. It, 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 uh, it doesn't believe that when uh, suddenly uh, conflict occurs between the masses and the ruling classes, that the masses are going to be able to self-organize in a way that enables them to overthrow the state. It romanticizes Lenin. 
It doesn't believe that the masses can organize, you know, uh, self-organize to overthrow the state at these moments of crisis, at these moments of confrontation. Therefore, there has to be a party of people who have prepared over a long period of time to do that. Now, I don't think the anarchist uh, uh, theory addresses that question in any serious way. I, I think that the, uh, the Lenin's model, the problem was that if that is true, if that model is what you need to overthrow the uh, state, uh, then what happens after you overthrow the state? How does that model become transformed into something that I'm sure uh, that we would, uh, you know, all agree we need that we want. Because he, uh, I'm not done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm to finish up today, yeah, I, I, I will, uh, the other people got done. Uh, so I think the uh, anarchist, I, I've never heard that question seriously addressed. And it was also said that, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Blanking on uh, oh, you mentioned uh, uh, Stalin that it wasn't a good uh, it wasn't a good way to overthrow Hitler. But the real question is, in the circumstances as they existed, was there another way? Not was it you know necessarily the best way? Doug, can I say something? If you want to say something, go ahead. She, she lets me do it. Don't know later why that's possible, but it's my husband. Uh, <laughs> Respectful, at least in public, oh. as an Italian thing, you know. But uh, <laughs> but I I like very. This was rankling me about Lenin too. I'd like to just take it a little bit to the side and then go back to what Doug said. There's more to Leninism than just the theory of a party. Not to say that the theory of the party is wrong, but Lenin uh, really developed a strategy which produced the first great victory, and I think most of the other subsequent victories of identifying the uh, alliance of the workers and the peasants. And seeing that without uh, moving of the party to do what Marx called peasants, he said they're like potatoes in a sack. Can you imagine? That they're so isolated, they would be unable to ever organize. You know, and um, Lenin, again, the partial was in Russia because of the commune and so on, and the revolutionary traditions among the peasants that he said that the party must form an unbreakable alliance with the peasantry. That was absolutely new in, in Marxism, and that's why I think today almost all communists are also Leninists. Uh, I, I think, though, too, with the, uh, I come from a very poor working class family, and when I read uh, what is to be done, I said, oh my God, that's true. I mean, I, you can't imagine if, if some, if, I, I was the only one that graduated from high school in my whole family. You can't imagine it. I mean, how little people might know because of oppression, of trying to pay the rent, of being unemployed, and the, the influence of religion, and the, the need to have some influence from somewhere. And to imagine that that's going to blossom all from within every household, every individual's mind is preposterous. But I do think, and I think you've alluded to this, Doug, too, there's still yet something that happened. I think without our understanding this, that Leninism, at least as it worked out, uh, depoliticized the workers where socialism existed. And so that when socialism went into crisis, the workers didn't fight back. And I think we have to we have to acknowledge that. And I do think that's where uh, there is something from uh, from anarchism that we can certainly bring in, because uh, as once power is uh, achieved, we have to open things up, even where there's risk. Because if we don't open it up for that risk, then later it could lead to a total collapse, is what occurred. And so that there's greater participation, there's more loosening up, loosening up, loosening up, despite what was happening externally to destroy the whole system. There really isn't probably another way, but uh, we don't want to throw our history into the dustbin.
you know, this is how we succeeded. We, once one third of the world was socialist, the rest of, the, another third of the world looked to that third of the world for leadership. We had two thirds of the world. You know, this, that was just 25 years ago. We can't dishonor that. We can't just throw that in the garbage. There were millions and millions of people that died for that. My, my father-in-law, who is uh, a partisan in, in Yugoslavia, he said that they died with, um, uh, hit, uh, with, they died with the names of Tito and Stalin on their lips. He said they went around painting signs every, long live Tito, long live Stalin. I mean, we, why are we throwing this all away? You know, I mean, why we don't have to do that? We don't have to focus on the parts that we didn't like. Why don't we focus on the parts that we like and figure out how to build from that? Uh, all right. Well, first of all, um, I, you know, first of all, when it comes to the question of like Stalin and you know fighting World War II, I just want to really quickly say I think it's great to have an honest interpretation of history. But otherwise, leave that shit behind, yes. right? Because the, it, it, we have to be honest about how World War II was won if we're historians. Um, and you know how fucked up Stalin was if we're historians. But otherwise, we need to figure out how to prevent fascism today. And that's not in the United States, but that's true in Europe and in certain parts of Latin America. They have to have an honest analysis of how to fight fascism. And if there's lessons to glean from something that happened 80 years ago, 90 years ago, then there's lessons to gleam, and if the, the situation is too different, we have to be, you know, it, it's very simple. The situation is just too different. And I think that the situation is just too, I'm, I never say we should dispense with Lenin. Uh, I certainly have the collected works over my bed. But, <laughs> no, 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 I'm going to wait for the avalanche, the vanguardist avalanche. But like, but the, but the reality is that I think, Lenin and Leninism are two separate things. And the United States does not look like Russia before the Soviet Union. It doesn't, right? I think that it is, it is it, we should understand that Lenin said scientifically, let's try to figure out how to make a revolution in Russia in 1905, 1910, 1917. And we have to look at how to make a revolution here today, which is a completely different conversation Regardless of if we think that the bourgeois Democrats versus the bourgeois Republicans is a new form of dictatorship of the markets or whatever, but I think that uh, so to, hopefully to get back to the to, to today, which I think is more important to some degree than you know amazing stuff that happened or terrible stuff that happened in Stalinist Russia or Czarist Russia, um, we're too small. The left is too small. It is too marginal for us to to be too obsessed with our divisions and our distinctions. In places like Brazil, Germany, and Greece, sometimes people realize that. And they say, we have to fight our local struggle, as well as our national and international struggle. Our struggle around questions of policing, deportation, housing, space, and labor, as well as our national and international questions of labor, imperialism, and militarism, um, together. Because right now, there's not, you know, with certain exceptions, right now there is not a, Counterbalance to that. Uh -oh. It's a flood warning. It's a flood okay. Warning. All right. So. <laughs> and that's that. So, so what what happens is I think is that we in Brazil a lot of times what some of the anti-authoritarian left and the PT uh, who is the ruling party now and the Trotskyist left have understood is that they need to fight together while they are still together and when one of them achieves enough power achieves a critical mass enough maybe to, to, to be elected into government, they can be traitors to the rest of the left. But allow. The, but we have to organize first together to get to those schisms. We're not at a place where we have time or energy to sit around debating our schisms. We need to organize together, whether that is on struggles of Fight for 15, or occasionally maybe to get to Kashama Sawan elected, or to, to fight cops in the streets, or to find, you know, to organize to abolish prisons, or to, you know, whatever the struggles are, locally and nationally and internationally, we need to work together until we can no longer work together and the contradictions are sharpened. So, uh, first, thank you so much for bringing up the modern school in Ferrer. Um, I'll talk to you later.
Yes. Uh, I'm presenting at the reunion of the Modern School at Rutgers in September, so I'll see you again. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not invited, so, so we're all set with that. Um, the question of, I think there's this false dichotomy between uh, the notion that um, Marxists plan, but anarchists are about sudden spontaneous revolution. There are some anarchists who say that. It makes my job a little more difficult. But there are uh, historically a lot of anarchists who who are similarly minded insofar as it takes a long time of, of building and growing a movement. If you read folks like Malatesta or Sebastian Thor, a lot of these turn of the 20th century folks, they are pretty clear that there should be uh, protracted labor struggles that <laughs> involve winning games, building popular power, so forth, stuff that you all, I'm sure, are really psyched about as well. Um, the, you know, the question is um, how to do that organizationally. Um, the question is, you know, can the masses, quote unquote, feel weird saying that, um, after a certain amount of time self-organize or not? Uh, I think they can. I don't think it'll happen all at once, but I think they can, and that there's really no choice to have real communism other than the workers doing it themselves. I think some other people have said that before too, right? Um, so, so I think the question is one of organization, uh, one of really not so much Marxism versus anarchism in my mind, so much as questions of to what extent are we anti-authoritarian, to what extent are we authoritarian. I know that some people don't like that label. I like using that label. Um, and then the question of international coordination uh, for an anarchist world, I think wouldn't be entirely dissimilar from what m many Marxists have in mind. The question is shifting from a command structure to a participatory structure. That's really the difference, that we can have uh, decision making emanate up from the locality to be coordinated at a region, to be coordinated at what we now refer to as national levels, at an international level. And that uh, we've seen the failures of command economies, we've seen the failures of market economies, something else that involves people's actual experiences, interests, desires, consumer preferences, working conditions has to be carved together uh, to make it work. Uh, and um, that's all for now. In terms of this um, bottom up, which in many situations is the way you organize. But after a revolution, there are going to be such inequalities of development, not only nationally and internationally. And I don't see how without a centralized force, you're going to get the, the uh, people who have a very high level of productive capacity to say, OK, we made it. We want it. <laughs> how are you going to get a transfer that develops another part of the world or another part of the uh, country without some kind of centralism. I, don't, I just don't see that uh, from the bottom up you would deal with the question of not being able to decide yourself what happens with all the surplus you produce when another part of the world cannot produce that much. Uh, it just seems to me only a central force can, uh, you know, can make those, help make those kind of decisions. Okay, uh, we have time for one more, one, maybe two more questions. Okay, back there. Thanks, I'll be brief. Um, I have been reminded today of something that Karl Marx said towards the end of his life. He said, I'm not a Marxist. Uh, this is Karl Marx himself. Uh, it's important, I think, to distinguish between Marx and Marxism. To remember that uh, when the ideology of Marxism took shape, that only a fraction of Marx's writings were available and translated. That if we had looked to, say, the earlier writings of Marx from 1844, that a very different kind of thinker emerges, one that's probably closer to what we've been talking about as anarchism here today. And even uh, towards the end of his life, Marx was confronted with the question of could the communes of the, Re the Russian peasantry be a basis for uh, communist socialist revolution in the 1880s, early 1880s. And he didn't dismiss them as nostalgic. He didn't dismiss them as uh, just wanting to go back to feudalism. He believed that, in fact, that could be 
uh, a kernel or a basis for a revolution as long as those peasants were connected with the international working class. So I think it's, it's very different if we looked at, if we were talking about Marx as opposed to Marxism here today. That's it. Last question. Yeah, I, I think one of the things I keep running onto yeah. this question of coordination and central body, I think those two words, I'm an anarchist organizer, I do most of my work in Africa international organizing. I don't, I think to be an administrator or some facilitator for a group, if you understand that like power over that group, that you talk on their behalf, that's a completely different dynamic when you understand that your responsibility is a liaison, like a connection between that local group and another local group somewhere. And I think that's what some of the kind of anarchists that are hanging around understand that we, we have to network, we have to get connections all over to be able to coordinate work, solidarity, pool resources where we have extra to support people elsewhere. But I guess the, the sensitivities, the, the idea that sometimes in the uh, Leninist literature or in the Leninist discourse, people have this concept that somebody has to make the decision and other people just need to follow because that person is in a position up in the hierarchy and that's what really frightens a lot of people in at least my anarchy circles that um, uh, someone should position himself as if he's smart enough to decide for a big group of people. So I just wanted to make that comment there. Okay, any last comments from the panel at all? Very brief one. Very brief. I think that um, to make it kind of an aphorism uh, just what going through my mind. I think the politics, our politics under uh, capitalism is about redistribution. That we're fighting for redistribution. Redistribution occurs under capitalism in two ways, through the state or through trade unions. So our job is to enter into the politics of the state to force as much redistribution as possible and to build unions. This is what will politicize and move working people of all kinds uh, toward uh, the, the belief that their engagement in politics is a worthwhile endeavor. I think after the revolution, it's really a question of the division of the produce. And the central planning leads to a fairer distribution of the production than it does if you break it down into communes and collectives. That was proven in Yugoslavia and everywhere else. So if you want a fair distribution, it requires a lot of central planning. If, if you break up the entire economy, fragment it into individual councils, there's very little distance between having the control and believing you have ownership and it becomes very, very hard for those groups to share in a wider way. That led to the fragmentation of Yugoslavia and generally everywhere that's occurred, and I expect it's going to occur in Cuba. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, um, just on the issue of centralization, uh, you know, um, people like minded anarchists are for a centralization of delegates in the sense that the people who are making these decisions aren't simply people who like went to college or went to economy school and like know how to make a good economy, but are representing the interests of the people that they're supposed to be making the decisions on behalf of. Um, the, the argument that the command economy worked is just like demonstrably not true. I may not have all the economic solutions, but we need to try something different that is neither market nor a small group of like supposedly smart guys deciding everything for us. Okay, let's give a hand to our